I got no friends in MMA. I, I'm not here to make friends, and I don't care about making friends, and I don't care what people think of me. I'm not here to make friends, I'm here to make money. You know, it, I'm a fighter, you know, I fight. Before I ever started doing jiu-jitsu, I got to fight some school. I didn't do good in school, you know what I mean? So, you know, I, I don't have a job now. That's what I do. I, I fight, you know, and if I don't get paid fighting, then, you know, or if I don't get I don't get this done fighting, then I'm, you know, I'm out of luck. So I'm going to I'm gonna have to do it right. And uh, I train hard. I'm, I go, you know, I've been boxing. Before I fight, I've been boxing like eight rounds a day, you know, like a... Nick Diaz and Colby Covington. Two different men with different fighting styles and a different type of fan base but very similar backstories, and two similar people in their lives. Nick Diaz was the older brother to the West Coast gangster, Nate Diaz. Colby was the blood brother to the East Coast gangster, Jorge Masvidal. But the relationship between these men's sagas goes much deeper than that. If we go back to March 2011, Colby was still a wrestler at Oregon State University, coming off of a dominant performance on the mat, and he had yet to make his MMA debut. While Nick, on the other hand, had defended his Strike Force welterweight title for the second time and was preparing to do so for the third time, having been in the sport of MMA for nearly a decade. Nick Diaz entered fighting as a way to survive, saying himself he did not do well in school and he could not find another way to make a living. He started training sambo at the age of 16 under Bulgarian national sambo champion Valery Ignatov. Around the same time, after seeing Henzo Grace in the UFC, he started training MMA under Steve Heath at the Animal House Gym, before joining Caesar Gracie's team. He dropped out of Toke High School in Lodi, California after attending for only one year and made his MMA debut August 31st, 2001 at the young age of 18. After winning his first four in a row, Nick would meet his first rival, Jeremy Jackson. Jeremy's got that heavy left. Oh, oh another oh that's... Nick is down. Oh no. look at the speeds. Jeez, are coming. He, no, this, okay. he needs to be stopped. That's it. Josh, Josh pretty down. There we go, Josh. Jeremy would give Nick his first loss, and at the time his only loss by TKO, after brutally battering him until the ref stepped in and stopped the fight. In under one minute. Nick was clearly hurt as he struggled to get back to his feet. He would go on to face Jeremy Jackson two more times, defeating him in both bouts and thereby winning the trilogy. First, by pounding him out in the second round of their initial rematch, and then by submitting him at UFC 44. It's good to point out that between these bouts, and possibly an achievement overlooked by fans, is that Nick Diaz won the inaugural WEC Welterweight Championship at this time. A title that his future opponent, Carlos Condit, would take almost four years after Nick. Nick then faced Robbie Lawler in their now classic bout, where both men stood in front of each other and boxed. Nick had shown his growth as a fighter since his MMA debut. Many expected Nick to try to take Robbie Lawler, who fashioned his style after Mike Tyson, trying to knock everybody out, to the ground, as Jiu-Jitsu was seen as his best and only strategy against beating someone like him. However, that's not what happened. Nick would go on to knock Robbie Lawler out, and finish him, showing that he had improved as a fighter and he was now well-rounded. He had great submissions on the ground, excellent grappling, he also had excellent boxing. Nick would go 4-4 four four in his next eight bouts before leaving the UFC and challenging KJ Noons for the Elite XC lightweight title. Nick was unable to take KJ down the first round and was being outboxed, as Noon had far more experience being a striker than Nick Diaz did at this point. Noons would open up two cuts on Diaz's eyes, giving him the famous Crimson Brow and the doctor would stop the fight after one round. An angry Nick Diaz would protest the stoppage and eventually storm out of the arena. Nick felt that he was the better fighter and that he was robbed of proving it over a silly cut, which he felt was not in any way inhibiting him from continuing the fight. He would finally get his rematch three years later and avenge his loss by soundly defeating Noons via unanimous decision in Strike Force, which would be the first defense of Nick Diaz's welterweight title. Colby Covington got his origins in fighting as a wrestler. He was 34-0 as a freshman at Iowa Central Community College, where he was roommate to the future light heavyweight champion, John Bones Jones. He won two 
Pac-10 champion gold medals and graduated in 2011 with a bachelor's degree in sociology. However, while in school, Kobe would get into street fights. Take his words from the man himself, Kobe became a professional fighter because his mom told him if he wanted to fight, he needed to go and get paid to do it. I always had Olympic aspirations to be an Olympic champion in wrestling, but I was getting in a lot of street fights in high school. And my mom pulled me, like whipped me in the side, they gave me some spankings with a wooden spoon, and she was like, if you want to fight, go get paid to fight. He joined American Top Team in 2011, where he would meet his friend, who would later turn to be his rival, Jorge Masvidal. The two would be like brothers, training together, living together, fighting together, and cornering each other in many of their fights. Kobe would go 5-0 before making his UFC debut in 2014. He would win the fight in the first round after pounding out AKA fighter Wang Anying. Kobe would win his next two fights by unanimous decision, before suffering his first loss by a guillotine at the hands of Rollery Alves. The loss was devastating for Covington and was evident on his face. I'm sure, however, rather than wanting to quit, this pushed Colby to fight even harder. And for the next two years, that's exactly what he did. He would fight five times and win all his bouts by dominating his opponents, drowning them in the sea of his cardio after overwhelming them with multiple strikes and high pressure wrestling. This is where one similarity between Nick and Colby is extremely evident. Both put a heavy pace on their opponents in their fights. Many people come out the gate like this. Robbie Lawler did. However, Robbie Lawler was unable to maintain that pace throughout the fight. Nick and Kobe were able to do so. How about Kobe's cardio? Well, I just did a breakdown on Kobe versus RDA. So, uh, you know, no doubt about it. His cardio is the best in the game. The best in the game. You know, uh, what he did was really, um, it was really impressive. The amount of energy and pressure and time, the density of his, of his attacks, one after another, nonstop, and there was a brief lull, I think, in, in round four. But other than that, it was a pace I probably... I would put up there with a Jake Shields, a George St. Pierre. Uh, who else had a, had a monstrous pace like this? Uh, you know, it's just that... It's not just... There's some guys who had a great striking pace, but this was a wrestling and striking pace. So this brings me a lot. You know, there are very few elite fighters that have done this. Um, I would put RDA in the bag as well, but, uh, you know, he outdid RDA with pace, so even higher than RDA. Nick would overwhelm his opponents with medium strikes to the body, and as the rounds went on, increase the pressure and increase the force behind the punches. And, you know, Nick Diaz changed the game in terms of his elite cardio. He did something that was a new thing, mm -hmm. and that new thing was... He's not going to hit you with 100% power. He's going to hit you with 50%. Yep. But he's going to hit you twice as much, and you're never going to get to breathe. And he's going to stay on top of you, and he's going to talk to you the whole time. So he's going to with you psychologically. Mm -hmm. He's going to disrupt your breathing by constantly hitting you. And then once he realizes you're hurt, then he's digging to the body. Then he's putting it on you. And Colby would come out with, with high-pressure wrestling, high levels of striking, and as the rounds progress, increase the amount of strikes he threw. Despite all his efforts, though, Colby was not a star. His hard work was not getting him the attention that he most definitely had earned, his respect to his opponents was overlooked, and his skills were not grabbing the attention of fans, due to his style being wrestler-based, which many fans today find boring. If you were slamming your opponents like Matt Hughes, and Michael Chandler, they're usually on your side. But even many fans who like explosive wrestling still prefer to see guys stand in front of each other and throw leather. Going into his fight with Damian Maya, Colby Covington was told he was going to be cut from the UFC. Whether he won the fight or not, it was the last fight on his contract, and once his contract was expired, Dana was not going to sign him. Dana more than likely knew he had a chance of beating Tyron Woodley, but he had no desire to have a champion that was not able to bring in a crowd like a superstar. And of course, after dominating Damian Maya in their fight, the chaos was born. I should have knocked him out! Brazil, you're a dog! All you filthy animals suck! I got one thing to say! Tyrell Woodley, I'm coming for you! If you don't answer the front door, I'm gonna knock in! And I'm gonna take what's mine! That one to win both! By playing dirty, Kobe had saved his career. And this is where another similarity between Nick and Kobe can be seen. Kobe was a quiet, nice guy, and people overlooked him for it. Nick was definitely a person who did not love being in the limelight or like doing interviews that much. But he was not the violent bad boy that everybody tried to make him out to be. And he hated that fans only liked him when he sold the bad boy image. said very nice things about you and you seem to have respect for him. Is that the case? Um, well, you're the only one that started about this fight. 
That's what I'm saying. Like, you're the one saying, oh, he says he's uh, going to, you know, we'll do this to you and that to you. I was giving an analogy about how I thought the fight might go if it, in, in my favor, if it did, you know. And Nick even said in an interview with Ariel Hawani years ago that he wanted to get a haircut so he would look more mature. Basically, shedding the bad boy image down to the way he appeared to other people. You know, here, people are, are, are more real about things, are real more, more hardcore. It's really, um, it's just, I feel like it's about show, you know, for, it's really for show out, out towards that way. And I feel like everybody was talking about me and has, uh, you know, all this negativity towards me. They're not, they're not, they're not coming for where I'm, from where I'm from, you know. These people, nobody hears anything from from anybody where I'm from. So that's why you hear so much negativity about me. Both guys just wanted to fight and make a living, earning money, doing what they were good at. Did you say to yourself, I, I, I'm gonna try to do mixed martial arts or were you doing that also on the side? Yeah, growing up in high school and college, I was doing MMA kind of on the side because I knew that in wrestling there wasn't like an outlet. There wasn't like an NBA or an NFL that I could go to and make a good income every year because wrestling doesn't make any money. So mm -hmm. if I wanted to make any money doing a professional sport, I had to go into MMA and the UFC. So I always had dreams and visions of being a world champion. So I was always training like the boxing and the jiu-jitsu on the side with the wrestling. And then as soon as I got done with college, I decided to go into MMA full time. and but both had to adapt by being a character that in some way was not really them. Of course, in their antics, there are still traits of them that come through. I'm sure Nick was really frustrated with the way he was treated. I'm sure that Kobe was just letting out a lot of the frustration that he was being overlooked, but he wasn't actually a mean person, just as Nick was actually not a street thug. If 2016 was the year of Nate Diaz, then 2019 was the year of Jorge Masvidal. Coming back from a layoff of over a year, Jorge won the award for the quickest foul in the UFC. One of the veterans of the game, play! Oh, strikes and white. Oh, oh is that enough? Wow. That's gonna be the quickest load. After Till rearranged his cup, he put Jorge flat on his back. With a left, Jorge never saw it coming. Jorge smiled, shook off the cobwebs, and in the second round, he sparked the number three ranked guy unconscious, putting him, according to the East Coast Gangster's words, directly into the shadow. Now, mind you, besides Tyron Woodley, nobody had beaten Till at this point. He had a bit of an eyebrow raiser in some fans' eyes against Steven Thompson, but there was no question he had done a much better job than Jorge did against Wonderboy. Now he was lying prostrate on the ground, not knowing where he was or what hit him. And the pro Till crowd was silent. This catapulted Jorge into stardom. Once Mohajid animated him, the stage was getting set. After Jorge knocked out Till, Backstage, he had a brief scuffle with Leon Edwards, a UFC welterweight. He landed some shots to Leon's face before being pulled apart. This show of machismo would set the stage for the next victim of Jorge's return. Enter Ben Askren. Fighters need attention to put people in seats. Opposites attract, and people of an opposing nature who rub each other the wrong way can definitely get attention to fight fans. But the attention Masvidal got from his next fight would be on an unprecedented scale. Ben Askren was a lifelong wrestler. He was never a well-rounded MMA fighter. Uh, I mean, just look at the guy striking. But he was an undefeated two-time champion, one FC champion, and Bellator champion. And like Masvidal, he had not fought for nearly two years. Both men left the cage in November of 2017 and both returned of March 2019. However, there was a difference in their return. Masvidal had destroyed his opponent in return, knocking him out. Ben was getting molly whopped by Robbie Lawler all over the cage, left and right being smashed, picked up and dropped on his head. I mean, this was classic Robbie Lawler and the fans were loving it. Now, I will give Ben what many people did not, credit for surviving the early onslaught and getting into a dominant position. That said, Robbie was still able to fight and sadly, the bout was stopped prematurely. Many people did criticized Herb Dean as being the reason why the fight was stopped early. However, since the fight was stopped prematurely, this took any credit from it that Ben would have gotten 
had the victory been sound. This set him perfectly against Basmadol. Both men had a nearly two year layoff, both came back in the same month, and both were coming back from getting dropped. Now Ben was being placed against Jorge, and the fans wanted Jorge to shut him up. The welterweight division that I want to fight, and I haven't fought any of them, right? So I, I got a long list. I could, I could fight every other month for the next couple of years uh, and fight a whole bunch of people I don't like. So the plan is you'll fight him later this year and then fight GSP next spring. Fight Usman? Yeah, and then GSP. Usman and GSP, yeah. Ben took the Chael Sonnen book and added a few new chapters. Chael held most of his big call outs to the champions, but Ben showed up and called out the entire top 10. He didn't care who they gave him, he just wanted to fight everybody. Till, Diaz, he even said he'd beat a prime GSP. With his first win being so controversial against Robbie and Jorge's being a dominant victory, fans were looking forward to the bout. But a reality check was due. Ben was a former college wrestler. He graduated with a record of 153 and 8 two Dan Hodge trophies, and a Shales Award, two NCAA championships, two Big 12 championships, 91 pins, the third most in NCAA division history, and he also competed in the 2008 Olympics. Jorge was a big underdog going into this fight. It was the classic grappler versus striker matchup, and many felt Jorge was going to get ragdolled by Ben, as he had previously in his fight with Damian Maya. While it was a razor close decision, and I do recall if I first watched it, I had a slight edge towards Jorge, or it should have been a draw, the point was that grappling was able to neutralize Jorge's superior striking. None of the fans were expecting what happened next. These guys just flapping gums at each other. Any chance they get. The fight clock is brought to you by Mogao. Oh! Biggest upset of 2019? Yes, in my opinion, especially inside the UFC. And Jorge Star was set. He cashed in on it. Parties, interviews, t-shirts. The guy started a YouTube channel that in a few weeks had over 669,000 subscribers. He didn't even have time to upload a silver button video when he got past 100K. While Colby's stock had risen since he called Brazil a dump, he couldn't top Jorge. Going in as a plus 185 underdog, turning out the fastest knockout in UFC history against a guy who was talking the most smack since Chael Sonnen. He had surpassed his blood brother in fame by a long shot, and he did the most important thing for a businessman to do. He pleased his fans, and he backed up what he said. When he was interviewed by Joe Rogan, I remember watching it, and he said that he wanted to break his face. He walked in and did just that, and people were excited for it. And the rest of they say is history, but not quite. There was one more piece to the puzzle. In 2016, Conor McGregor was the face of MMA. He talked the talk, he walked the walk, and he knocked everybody out. Well, minus Max Holloway. But the best way to shut up a hype train is to feed him to the beast of the division. In this case, that man and the champion happened to be one of the same, Jose Aldo. Jose had held the WEC and later the UFC featherweight trap for nearly a decade. He had destroyed the competition that was put against him. I know a lot of people like to associate Dominic Cruz with being the boogeyman to the team alpha male, but Jose is not far. Having defeated Mendez two times, favor, he was set to make his title defense against Conor McGregor. I remember when this fight happened and I picked Conor to win not based on his speed and KO power, but because I believe he had gotten inside of Aldo's head. My dad was a big fan of Muhammad Ali and talked a lot about the psychological warfare behind combat sports and how Ali would talk trash, not necessarily to just sell a fight, but also to get inside his opponent's head. In studying how Ali turned Listen into a charging bull instead of a cautious boxer, I expected McGregor to do the same to Aldo. highly anticipated featherweight fight of all time. Here we go! Green trunks for the southpaw, the notorious Conor McGregor. Black trunks for the champion, Jose Aldo Jr. Conor relaxed and smiling. Oh, oh no! He slept him! Like that! Conor oh, McGregor oh. is the new UFC featherweight champion of the world! But I did not expect that. 
I was expecting a battle and was a little disappointed that it was over so soon, but what a knockout. Enter the West Coast Gangster. Nate Diaz was in a similar place when he fought Conor McGregor as Masvidal was when he fought Darren Till. He had an 18 and 10 record, he had one shot at UFC gold in 2012, and he got whopped in a one-sided beatdown by Benson Henderson, losing every single round. Nobody was expecting him to take UFC gold, but being a Diaz, he called out the king of the UFC at the time. Conor McGregor, you're taking everything I work for. When the two finally met, Diaz was a huge underdog. But to put it in words, he was about to shake up the world. He don't. Nate went forward and choked McGregor out. Nate was now a superstar. This is another relation between Colby and Nick Diaz. Both guys' brothers were big stars before they were. Yes, Nick was definitely the bigger star in 2011 than Nate, but Nate surpassed Nick by a long shot when he defeated Conor McGregor. I knew a lot of people at the time who didn't even watch MMA, but they knew who Conor McGregor was. They didn't know who most of the fighters were. And when Nate Diaz beat him, everyone was talking about Nate Diaz. People at school, people at work. I mean, the guy was just now, he was putting himself in legendary status. Not only that, it was headlighting on Google. I went to look something up the morning after the fight, and there was a picture of McGregor tapping. In my opinion, I always thought Nick was the better of the two fighters, but it was Nate's blood and guts and dragging the UFC's number one superstar into deep waters and choking him out that showed who the superstar was. You can see the resemblance between Nick and Colby as the fame of Nate and Jorge surpassed both men. Nick Diaz was the undisputed strike force welterweight champion. In his reign, he defended his title three times. One win by decision in a grudge match with KJ Nunes, one submission over Santos, and my favorite, the Hagler versus Hearns of MMA. His one round war with Paul Simtex Daly. Imagine that he's doing that to you, and he's doing that to you. There's a left hook by Daly. Diaz! Oh! Daly! Diaz is moving his head, though. Daly has to be very careful. That kick almost caught Diaz in the head. That would have been Daly to swing and expose himself. Get him to reach. He's looking for those holes. It opens up the head. Diaz elbow strikes. Taking up for his world welterweight title. Sadly, as we all know, Strike Force folded. Story for another day. And the UFC bought out the fighters' contracts. Carlos Condit was the WEC welterweight champion. He also had three title defenses. His organization also folded, and he was put into the UFC. After making his debut, losing a split decision, he put together four straight wins, three of them being finishes. Knockout of Dan Hardy. Knockout of Don Hyung Kim. And a TKO of Roy McDonald. Will it be enough? You know, judges are very reluctant to score around 10 8. 15 seconds. Unbelievable guts shown by both fighters. That's it. It is all over with 10 seconds left. While it seemed that Nick had a bit of an easier road fighting BJ Penn in his UFC return, he was now set to face the natural born killer for the interim belt. Why? Because GSP was injured. Not quite. 
Carlos Condit was originally not going to get an interim championship fight. He was also not going to fight GSP. Nick Diaz was the bigger star, and it guaranteed a bigger paycheck for the UFC if Nick Diaz, who was the Strike Force welterweight champion, fought GSP, who was the UFC welterweight champion. And also, again, the opposites were attracting each other. GSP was the clean cut, proper guy, the good guy. Nick Diaz was the bad boy, the one who would trash talk. You know, it was just perfect to set these two guys against each other. However, despite Nick Diaz's post-fight call out, even though you just beat BJ Penn in an outstanding fight, what's on your mind right now? I don't think George is hurt. I think he's scared. I think he's scared to fight everybody right now. What's up? Where you at, George? He is the initial reason the fight didn't happen. He was not supposed to fight BJ Penn when he showed up. He was supposed to fight GSP when he came into the UFC. However, Nick Diaz did not show up for the press conferences. He got pulled for the fight, and Carlos Condit was offered the fight. Then, GSP got injured. Carlos Condit got injured, so he didn't fight Nick Diaz. BJ Penn stepped in, fought Nick Diaz. And since GSP was still on an injury, they were going to put Carlos Condit against Nick Diaz to fight for the interim strap. And the winner of that fight was guaranteed a match against GSP. Complicated, but that's what happened. When the fight finally came, people expected fireworks. Nick Diaz was coming off of a good win against BJ Penn, and before that, he had been finishing people inside Strike Force. Carlos Condit had a string of knockout victories. Nick Diaz, Nick landed a nice one of his own. Nick just started talking to him. Yeah, that didn't take long. And that bothers guys. That bothers guys a lot. This is what Nick wants to do, but Carlos is a throw. Like this. Yeah, that's punches and bunches. Yeah, that's that is, what you call a yeah. kick. Oh, flying knee. This is a fight for the interim welterweight championship. Two. And they're both anybody, Joe, how close this has been. Nick Diaz landed a good combination where he can't do damage. Nick dropped down for a sink. I mean, a header behind on the scorecards, it doesn't matter. That's it, there's switches. Final seconds and of the fight. It. Condit's out. And Condit's on top of him. And it is over. It's gone the distance. Carlos Condit and Nick Diaz. Look at this. Although they were not extremely pleased with what happened, the outcome was not disappointing to me. I agree with most people who study the fight that Carlos Condit won the last three rounds. I don't think either man really dominated the other. In the first two rounds, I do believe Nick Diaz was definitely doing a lot more damage, and you could argue that he dominated the second round with his forward pressure and body attack, but he just didn't do enough to win. A lot of people argue that, well, they gave the fight to Condit because he was point fighting as opposed to winning the fight. While you could argue that's true, he definitely landed more strikes than Nick Diaz, and Nick Diaz just stood there a lot of times with the fight with both his hands down, not doing anything. I felt it was no robbery in order at all, and that Carlos Condit fought a smart, technical fight and got the victory. However, fans were still clamoring for GSP versus Nick Diaz, and so was GSP himself. Now, as we stated previously, Colby Covington was able to save his career by calling out the entire country of Brazil, which of course got a lot of media attention. And then you guys know he went on social media, he started talking a lot more trash, he started spoiling movies. He was basically doing everything he can to be the heel and the bad guy to get all the attention he could possibly have in order to get eyes on him. And the UFC took notice. He called out Tyron Woodley after he beat Damian Maya and said it was Tyron Woodley he wanted to fight next. However, much like Nick Diaz didn't fight GSP when he first came to the UFC, Colby Covington didn't fight Tyron Woodley. According to Dana White, Dana White did offer Colby Covington the fight after Kamara Usman beat Tyron Woodley. According to Dana, Colby turned it down because he felt he wasn't being paid enough. The negotiations went back and forth, back and forth, and then finally, Colby Covington and Kamara Usman got to fight. And man, oh man, did they go to war.
After such a wonderful fight, many people were claiming for a rematch. Much like people feeling that Nick Diaz was robbed in his decision against Carlos Condit, many people felt that Colby Covington had been robbed against Kamara Usman. I watched the fight again and again, and while I do agree with one judge's scorecard having it 2-2, two and two, I can't argue too much against it being 3-1 and one going into the 5th for Colby Covington, because the round was razor close. After watching it again and again, I thought maybe the break in between could have had me leaning a bit more towards Colby than I should have been, but it honestly could have been a draw. However, I do disagree that it was 3-1 Usman. The fight should have been going 2-2 two two into the 5th round. In many fans' eyes, Colby Covington was robbed of winning with an early stoppage. They had been going back and forth and Colby Covington had been walking forward, going through everything Kamara was throwing at him, outstriking him, throwing body shots, throwing kicks, and then in the fifth, Kamara was able to crack Colby. While you can argue that maybe the stoppage was early, you cannot argue that Kamara had finally found a home for his right hand. He dropped Colby two times, Colby got back to his feet and was put flat back on the canvas again. Colby complained and kept talking the talk. However, now he was a superstar, and in doing so, he had also made Kamara one. But sadly for him, the belt was still not wrapped around his waist. So if we reiterate, the situation between Nick and Colby is closer here. Nick was the reason the initial fight with GSP didn't happen. Colby was the initial reason the fight with Kamara didn't happen. Nick wound up fighting Carlos Condit for an interim belt. Colby wound up fighting Kamara Usman for the undisputed belt. Both fighters were walking forward trying to win and extinguish their opponent, and both fighters complained a whole lot about their opponent cheating as the fight went on. Nick retired after he lost. Colby, however, did not. Nick Diaz and Colby Covington would both get another shot at gold. In the case of Nick Diaz, he'd finally fight George St. Pierre, and he'd be fighting St. Pierre on his home turf. This time, Nick was not only the bad guy, but he was the guy who everybody wanted GSP to destroy. And although he didn't like it, he was getting a shot at UFC gold. However, it was a blowout. The fight was not at all boring, at least not in my opinion. A lot of people complained of GSP taking him down, but hey, the guy had a wrestler based style, and he took Nick down at will. Not only that, he was hammering him all over the place in the first round. I am pretty sure if this was not Nick Diaz, who is known by now for having a legendary chin made out of iron, or this was not a title fight, this probably would have been stopped. As the fight progressed, Nick appeared a little bit frozen when he was in the stand-up. He wasn't really pressuring forward like he had at Carlos Condit. At times, he would stand in the of the center of the octagon, and it was GSP who would initiate the striking. I know Nick was, of course, worried about being taken down, but it seemed even when he stuffed a takedown, he didn't really want to engage in a fight at all. GSP wound up soundly defeating him 50-45 to 45 on all three judges' scorecards, and I can't really disagree with that. The closest Nick came to winning a round would be the third, where he was able to stop two takedowns and escape off the ground once, and land some pretty good shots. While he definitely was able to crack GSP a few times with his jab, he just did nowhere near enough to even win a round, let alone make the fight competitive. He was destroyed, but he showed humility in defeat, lifting GSP's hand afterwards. Everything that he did to try to get inside of GSP's head failed or backfired. However you want to look at it, he didn't get gold wrapped around his waist. Colby Covington's second shot at UFC gold was his rematch with Kamara Usman. And it went very similar to the way that GSP versus Nick Diaz went. While a lot of fans were arguing that if it wasn't for the second round, Colby would have won, I have to disagree there. Yes, Colby landed a hard shot in the fifth, but I don't think that was enough to steal the round for him. The first round, he came out slower than he did before. The same way that Nick wasn't walking forward against GSP, Colby was not constantly trying to walk Usman down like he had the first time. He had respect for Usman's power, and he also had respect for the boxing that Usman had developed with all his time training with Trevor Whitman. It was also showing. Colby missed a whole lot of shots in this fight. The hooks to the body that were landing before were missing. The uppercuts that were cracking Kamara Usman's dome were not doing that anymore. He was getting counterpunched. In the second round, it really started to come apart for Colby. He was dropped two times. If there were about 30 seconds left on the clock, he probably would have been stopped. After that, he came out cautious in the third and the fourth. In the fifth, he did try a little bit more to end the fight, but it was way too little, far too late. Just like Nick did with GSP, Kobe showed his respect to Usman, even saying that he knew it was all about money and just hype to get the fight going. He did what he had to do, but like Nick, he failed to get gold wrapped around his waist. Find, find a shortcut, find, find a way to get it done. Yeah. 
I just believe myself. I never stop believing my brother. Thanks, man. Actually, I appreciate that, man. Um, I don't know. Uh, I know you could live your life the way you want, but I think you should uh, show this side of you more, the, the, the real humble life, you know? I know a lot of people... Are I mean, I feel good about that, and uh, and uh, it's whatever. I'll fight anybody. Just let me get paid for that. This pro boxing, you know, we want to. I hear pro boxers get paid, you know, way more. So of course, let's do it, you know. And that's pretty much the end of the story for now. It leaves with Nick and Colby. Colby will most definitely probably get another shot at UFC gold, but the question is, will he ever be able to defeat Kamara Usman? Usman seems to reign supreme in his place. Both guys were going against the best welterweights at the time in their division. Nick had GSP, who, who many to this day still consider the greatest of all time, at least in the welterweight division. And Kobe had Kamara Usman, who currently is on his way to becoming the greatest of all time inside the welterweight division. This is the end of the documentary, but is it the end of the story? Do you think Kobe will ever have gold wrapped around his waist?